Could we? No. But could we? No. We could though. Who knows? It's too early to decide. Seven games in or eight games in, it's too early to decide. All Spurs fans you'll talk to are keeping humble, are keeping quiet in terms of a title talk challenge. We're just happy where we are. If you asked us at the start of the season with losing Harry Kane, with the toxic mess the club was in that Conte put us through, that Jose and Nuno put us through, everyone, including Spurs fans, predicted us to finish low. Now, a lot of professional pundits said lower half of the table. Lower half. I know we were bad, but still, even I predicted us to finish like 8th and 7th, you know? Historically, in the last 10 years, and I know, of course, it's not the past, but in the last 10 years, we've qualified for the Champions League like, <clears throat> I think, 6 or 7 out of the 10 times in the last 10 years, and... I feel like people forget just uh, how much reg how how regular we are in the Champions League um, in, the, in the last decade, and I feel like that's played a lot of um, it's played a lot of rival fans uh, to predict us to finish so low. And honestly, that's fine because we want to stay as under the radar as possible. We want to make sure that we are underdogs because that's what suits our narrative. Yeah, there's you know all this talk Spurs or bottlers and you know we can't handle the pressure just we just don't care we just we just don't care anymore we just want to watch good football good attacking football and for the first time in since 2017-18 that season at Wembley for the first time since then we've got our top back we've got our DNA back to dare us to do we're actually seeing some good football and it's been so long since we've seen such good football because Pochettino in 18-19, yeah, we got to the Champions League final, but wow, did that paper over the cracks of our league form. We were awful. We won one away game in like 11 months and that was a Harry Winks winner in like the 93rd minute from an Nkudu cross at Craven Cottage in like February. One away win in like 11 months. And to top off, our home form wasn't that great either. It was a miracle we got top four that season. And even, of course, the Champions League final is a bigger miracle. But we had no right to be in that final. We had a midfielder, Winks and Sissoko. Were we ever meant to be favourites? Of course we were going to lose the final. We didn't bottle it. We were just never favourites to win it. But Ange Postacoglu has come in now after the drab football at the end of the Pochettino era, after the consistent, boring nature of Jose Mourinho. And I, I like Jose. I've always liked Jose and I still like Jose. I just don't like his football. I just don't like his football at all. And I'm someone that truly believes that Jose should have been given that League Cup final and not been sacked, like, you know, not been sacked the week before. And I know a lot of it was to do with, like, the Super League fiasco. And, um, yeah, you know, honestly, I can't give excuses to Levy for that one, like, sacking him before Cup final. But he should have been sacked months before that anyway. So, yeah, he should have been sacked ages ago anyway. So that's my point there. And then Nuno was just the wrong hire completely. If we went from Pochettino to Nagelsmann, that would have been so much more in line with our philosophy. But that was such a big mistake from Daniel Levy. Going straight from Pochettino to Jose Mourinho. And I know he's got this weird fetish for Jose because um, he wanted to sign him in 2003. I think uh, before he went to Port... Was it during his time at Porto? Before his Porto or after Porto? But either way, he wanted him in like 2002, 2003... Um, he's always wanted him throughout his career, and he finally got him. And uh, yeah, it's. I think I don't think it was the Jose he was expecting, or the Jose that was backed properly either. I mean, uh, the defensive reinforcements Jose received was Regulon, Doherty, and Roden. Um, so, I mean, yeah, he's he can make you know he still had obviously Vertonghen and Alderweireld, but they were aging. So I don't place too much blame on Jose. However. His football was getting old. And then Nuno, he was just out of his depth. There's no point even talking about him. Conte came in. Conte came in when we were in a rough place. We were in the Conference League. He's come in mid-season, November. He's coming in November. Into a team that's lost like four London derbies in a row. Like four in a row. 
or like five London derbies like on the bounce in like a month, like Palace, Arsenal, can't remember all the other games. Um, because I've blanked it out my memory. Well, when he came in, there was some real optimism because it's an elite manager in his prime, fresh off the back of winning Serie A. He'd never gone into a club mid-season. He'd always go into clubs at the end of a season in the summer because he needs time to implement his philosophy, whatever that is. Um, so he's never come into a squad mid-season before. So a lot of people were thinking, wow, this Tottenham squad must be uh, very special for him to come in mid-season. And... Yeah, the results were good. The performances were good. We beat City home and away. Um, two draws to Liverpool home and away. We uh, beat Arsenal 3-0 in the North on the Derby. Things were looking good with Conte. And then we backed him in the summer. Now, we did back him. We spent a lot of money. But God knows why we uh, spent £60 million on Richarlison when Conte clearly needed a centre-back. That £60 million should have been put towards a centre-back. As much as I actually do like Richarlison, and we'll get to him soon, I do like Richarlison, but that 60 million needed to go into a centre-back for Conte's sake. Now, I'm not excusing Conte because, wow, wow, after a backing in the summer and full pre-season and all the interviews and press conferences and all the training and all the games played, oh, I hate the guy. I hate him. I actually hate him now. He's grown into one of the most unlikable people that's ever managed Tottenham, and I, I'm really, uh, I really do not miss him whatsoever. So, nine months ago, I think it was the epitome of nine months ago. Uh, Romero, there was a lot of noise about Romero um, not giving it all for Spurs, like prioritising um, the national team for Argentina, which only makes sense, you know, they just won the World Cup. <laughs> Messi's playing just out of his mind as always. That national team is on like a, is that a fifty game unbeaten streak or something like that it's it's mental and they've not con they've conceded like two goals in like 15 games or something like that it's mental so of course the buzz around the Argentina camp is going to be excellent and there was a lot of criticism that came for Cuti Cuti Romero um, that he was given more for Argentina than he was for Tottenham and you know things have been like that in the past with you know with Lamella and that sort of thing, like, they've, no, not so much for Lamella, I mean La Celso, yeah, La Celso more, like, La Celso would always be fit for the international breaks, that was the joke. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Cootie, it didn't always seem like he was giving his all for Tottenham, and he was very unfocused in that season for Conte, reckless, red cards, so a real detriment to the team. Um, but this season has just been unbelievable, and just come in, and just come in, with a wealth of experience. The man has coached in Australia, in Japan, in Celtic, and do not discredit those countries and leagues, because to build your way up, to work your way up to the Premier League, the Premier, this is the Premier League, to work your way up from Australia to the Premier League, not being a high profile former player, if you're a high profile former player, i.e. Mikel Arteta, Pep Guardiola, Andrea Pirlo, you're gonna get given opportunities, and those are great managers, besides maybe not Pirlo, but we'll see in a few years' time anyway, like Xabi Alonso. Those managers will be given the opportunities because, you know, excellent football brains, they're already in the infrastructure. It just makes sense to give them a chance, really. However, what we tend to discriminate against a lot is experience from outside of Europe. Ange Postacoglu went into Brisbane Raw, took them from struggling mid-table lower relegation into Raw Salona, into a team that was so good that um, they broke all records. And then he went to Japan, did the same thing with um, Yokohama. Yokohama, F Marinos, I think that was the team he managed there. And um, he just had such an eye for talent. And then when he went to Celtic, he was met with so much criticism and scepticism from pundits, uh, from fans about who is this guy? Why are we signing a manager from the J League, the Japanese League? This is Celtic Football Club. We're a big institution. We're playing the Champions League. But this is a Celtic that's just come off the back of not winning any trophies in a season. Not quite sure for how long, but for a very long time, Celtic didn't win any trophies and Rangers' dominance were was, was tip-top. Rangers were dominating. Um, and then Postacogli comes in. He brings in his talents from the J-League, because he doesn't care about where you're from. He cares about if you have the ability to play football, you're going to play for Postacoglu. So he brought in gems like Kamada, now actually Hatate, can't remember all of them, 
And I actually, I don't know. If, yeah, yeah, Hatate for sure as well. Um, did he bring in Jota too? Anyway, his eye for talent has just been absolutely excellent. And all his signings tend to just be just perfect for exactly what he needs. Not based off of reputation, not based off of background, but based off of playing ability. Now, for, it does actually help Postacoglu if the player is from a background kind of similar, a similar ilk to his own background, where they scrap their way through the leagues and make it to the big time. Which brings us on to the players that we have this season. I'm going to go for each player and talk about how their season's gone so far. Now, I mentioned how Postacoglu likes a player that scrap their way from you know, lower leagues all the way to the top division. Guglielmo Vicario, right? Empoli, goalkeeper last season. Best Italian goalkeeper in the league last season. The stats prove it as well. The eye test proved it too. You ask any Serie A fan last season, and Guglielmo Vicario was just immense. And he was only 17 million euros because a lot of... um. His background was, of course, coming from the lower leagues of Italian football and then playing for like a, a lower a lower table Serie A side. It's, and um, he just tends to get overlooked. Where, whereas, um, of course, like Man United are paying 55 million for Onana, who is, and I still believe, is a brilliant goalkeeper. But um, it's looking so expensive compared to Vicario and even... Spurs could have signed David Raya from Brentford for 40 million. And that would have been a great signing. Ray is a great ball playing goalkeeper. 40 million would have been a bit much. But it's the price you pay these days, isn't it? No, apparently not. Apparently not, because we got Guglielmo Vicario for 17 million. And he's been really good. He's been really good. Not many clean sheets, of course, because of our play style. That's only to be understood. But when he's been called upon, when he's needed to be called upon, it's been solid and it feels so strange to have to go from Hugo Lloris from for the last 11 years your captain Hugo Lloris your goalkeeper plays every game who made a mistake from what seemed like six times a season he'd make a mistake and always in the big games as well to go from that to Vicario is just so comforting now, of course, we're eight games in, Vicario could have a mare still, but so far, he's just made me so. He made me. He's made me feel so relaxed. Ball playing ability, shot stopping wise, brilliant. Now another one as well was uh, I'll talk about the right backs now. Porro and Royale. Now Royale actually started the first game of the season, and I'm a big fan of Royale ever since his red card at Arsenal. Um, was it two years ago? Or year ago? I don't remember. Ever since his red card against Arsenal, which I don't think that was a red. It was more of an amber card. Anyway, um, that was his lowest low, right? All Spurs fans, even me, wanted him gone, wanted him cut. But over the months, pieces started to come out, um, interviews started to come out, PR pieces, articles, and we could see it in training, and then we could see it in games, that he was working so hard to improve. He was working so hard to become better. He spent a million of his own dosh on a hyperbolic recovery chamber, I think that's I think that was it. A hyperbolic recovery chamber. You don't invest a you don't invest a million into improving your own game unless you're serious about your game. And he did everything he could. Now, also Royale, not a traditional wing back, was playing in a wing back role for Antonio Conte. He was playing in a wing back role, which just didn't suit him. And he did his best. Now under Ange, this inverted fullback role suits him a lot more. He started against Brentford, a little bit shaky against um, the likes of Mbermo and Visser, but he still he scored a goal as well. He was decent, but then Pedro Porro starts the next game, and wow, he blows my expectations away now. When Porro first made his debut, I think it was in the 4 1 against Leicester, when Leicester battered us 4 1 which was just a freakish result of the season. That, that they, I don't think they won a game for like 10 games after that result. It's just a weird, weird Tottenham result. 4-1 Leicester, and they get relegated, and they beat us 4-1. Madness. Anyway, he made his debut that game, I think, and he got battered, and that is a fact. He got battered that game, and um, it wasn't looking good for him. But he slowly kept playing. Of course, he's a natural wing-back, so he was fitting in Conte's system anyway. Started improving and improving, and... Got his goal against Man United um, last season. 
Stop becoming a real fan favourite. But then when Postacoglu came in, we didn't know if he could play this inverted fullback role. So we know he's a great wing back, you know, driving down the wings, crossing, shooting. He's good at that. But defending? No. Passing and composure on the ball? No. But apparently, yes. Postacoglu's come in, he's put an arm around his shoulder and said, You're gonna play an inverted fullback role for me. So now we see Porro inverting into the midfield and playing like a deep line playmaker. And it suited his Spanish play style so well. His passing has been unbelievable. His pass for the Son hat-trick goal against Burnley, the one where he picks up the ball just behind the halfway line, bends a beautiful threaded pass between two defenders for Son to run in and score. That is the epitome of just how good Petra Porro has been. Top, top fullback in the league right now. Not the top, obviously. A top fullback in the league right now. Top four for me. Beautiful player. And he's only going to get better. He's 24. Royale's 23, Vicario's 26, these players are only going to get better. And then we've got Romero, who, as I said last season, disastrous. But look who was around him last season, Lloris, Dyer. All these players were around him last season, so it can be a bit frustrating for us to watch them. What do you think it's like to play next to them? So we've brought in a whole new defence to play with him, and he has taken to that vice-captaincy role and he is taking it like a duck to water. He is looking like a real leader on the pitch. There was a quote that came out yesterday, during the international break. He's, he got subbed at half time, or in the 48th minute or something like that. But apparently it was his choice to be subbed off because he felt a slight discomfort. And even though the game was still in the balance, it, you know, I know it was 2-0, you know, they could always make a comeback. The game was still technically in the balance. He came off, because, and he said in the interview himself, I don't want to avoid injuries because, I want to avoid injuries because there's a big game on Monday coming for Tottenham against Fulham. And that is so refreshing to see. That is weird, that was weirdly refreshing. So, especially when Son is playing, now I love Son more than anyone in the world, right? Almost. Um, and he is playing the full 90 minutes against the 10 men of Vietnam when they were already Six, they, they, they won 6 0 against 10 men. Son scored on like the 65th minute to make it like 4 0 or something. And he's still on the pitch. Why is he playing the full 90 minutes against 10 men in a friendly? What's the fucking point? What is actually the point of that? Son needs to take control of that situation. Jurgen or Klinsmann obviously needs to take him off. But Son himself needs to come off himself. He needs to understand that safety comes first. Now, I've, the general consensus among a lot of Korean fans, and obviously I can't speak for South Korean fans, but they really want Son to win a trophy with Tottenham, and they don't really care about a friendly against Vietnam. They care more about the three points on Monday. Now, please forgive me if I'm wrong, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe South Koreans care more about the three points on Monday than um, Son going off um, when they're free no up against 10 men against Vietnam. That's just what I think. Anyway, yeah, I can't believe Romero came out with that comment, and that just shows the masterstroke of Ange to make him vice-captain. To change the leadership group from Eric Dyer, Hugo Lloris, Harry Kane, and Pierre-Emil Ruibier, and Oliver Skip, to, um, to Romero, Madison, and Son, was just genius from Postacoglu. Because Son, who's just the most likeable person you're, just, you're likely to ever meet, who's so bubbly, who's friends with absolutely everyone, who takes youth players under his wings like Papsar, um, who's just a smiley face around the club, who's a fantastic club ambassador, who's a global icon, who's a genuine world-class finisher. As our captain, amazing. As our vice captains, Romero and Madison, Romero, of course, to have the South American influence for the dressing room, and that dressing room is looking good right now, and Madison, just because he's a cheeky chap and, uh, you know, he, he's done a lot of growing in the last two years. I think a relegation with Leicester and, you know, becoming a father, uh, being a family man, it's really made him the main man at the dinner table. And uh, he's really relishing that role too. So I think inspired captaincy choices by Postacoglu. Unbelievable. And then Mickey van der Ven. I uh, see, I was one I was one that was edging towards Edmund Tapsoba from Leverkusen. Um, for like 55 million, even though of course it was you know 15 million more than Van der Ven would have been. I thought the um, Tapsoba was uh, more impressive, and Tapsoba's having a brilliant season for Leverkusen. He's, he's 
he's such a good player, and he takes penalties too, which is um, very cool. Um, I'm not sure if he still does. Maybe Bonifacio takes him for Leverkusen now, but yeah, um, Tapsoba's been incredible for Leverkusen, and I have no doubt if we had signed Tapsoba over Van der Ven, Tapsoba would have been incredible too, because he's still young, the Burkina Faso centre back. Um, but Van der Ven is just been unbelievable and van der ven looks to be looks to be just as good as tabsoba but looks to have a high ceiling as well as being i believe younger too and very evidently much much pacier as well which is just which is just freakish the man is what six foot five left footed dutch international now and probably the quickest center back on the planet right now if you saw his debut for the Netherlands, um, he had this beautiful run where he held off the man as well as making a long musting run and then just beautiful tackles. Great debut for Holland as well. But yeah, he's been so good for Tottenham. So good. Playing out from the back, calm and composed. You know, a few, a few moments, he's 22. He's going to score an own goal. He's going to make a mistake. But that's Poster Coglu's system. Puts his arm around the shoulders of the players and says, that's all right, mate. Just don't boot the ball long. Tottenham ranked 20th for long balls. 20th. We don't play it long. We play it short. So if we make a mistake, it's okay. That's all right. That's all right with Posta Coglu. Then Udogi. Destiny Udogi, the Italian international now. Well. He also made his debut over the international break. Wow, what a player. Wow. You cannot tell me you expected this 20-year-old to start in the Premier League. To even start. I thought Ben Davis might start the first few games because I thought Ben Davis actually the inverted fullback role kind of suits him a little bit, but Udogi's just made that spot his own, and I am shocked at the caliber of player we had here. Now I saw a few games obviously for Udinese last season, so I could keep an eye on Udogi, but I did not expect this a step up of another level coming from Destiny, coming from the Italian. I did not expect this level of step up. The man is looking absolutely incredible from an attacking threat and a defensive threat. The man has gone up against Saka, who he did get cooked in the first 15 minutes and even got a yellow card. However, with a yellow card in a North London derby at the Emirates after 15 minutes and he's on a yellow, to then shut down Saka throughout the rest of the game? Unbelievable. Did the same with Salah until Liverpool did deservedly have the man sent off. Even when the game was... You know, ferociously 50-50 and Liverpool looking threatening. Um, Adogi obviously was getting beaten by Salah, but he was also giving it back to Salah as well, I thought too. And then it's just unlucky for Salah that he had to come more central. Um, you know, because that, that, that was looking like a tasty matchup. I thought I thought Adogi would have done well in that matchup. But of course, Salah was, for me, the best player in the Prem. Um, I love Salah so much. He, top, top player for me. Much better than um, he's for, for me, best player, Premier League player in the last five years for sure in the Prem, without a doubt. Um, and then we've got Basuma, who's just rejuvenated. This is Bryson's Basuma, and a little bit more. This is what we expected to see, and a little bit more. When a player steps up to a big six club, they either sink or they swim. And Basuma, we thought he was drowning, but it turns out it was just Conte's horrific management. Horrific, horrific man management. It's disgusting how he's treated Basuma and Pap 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 Sar as well. Right, starts at the San Siro, starts in the North London derby. We don't see him again for the rest of the season. And he puts in a great. He was the best player on that pitch when Arsenal beat us two 0 at White Hart Lane last year. He was the best player on that pitch. We don't see him again. He was one of our best players at the San Siro too. And it's criminal. He gets dropped for that. But Basuma and Sar have produced a fantastic partnership in the middle. Mazy dribbles, feints, great defending, long busting runs, Saar scoring his first goal against United with a late run into the box. Just unbelievable. They're just fantastic to have him. Ben Tanker is obviously coming back soon. He will be displacing Pap Saar from the lineup. And I'm okay with that. It gives Saar a bit more competition. Saar is only 20. Needs the competition. Ben Tanker will provide that. Because he is a level above Saar. So when Ben Tanker comes back, a midfielder Basuma, Ben Tanker and Madison, dangerous. That's dangerous. And I hope Ben Tanker is back next month. Because uh, December is going to look busy for fixtures and January. So having Ben Tanker also 
African Cup of Nations and the Asia Cup is in January. So we're actually losing Basuma, Saar and Son. So we need Ben Tanker to be integrated back immediately so that he can get used to Postacogli's play style. So that then when January rolls around, him and Hoybia can be accustomed to playing the Postacogli way. And I think they'll do it. They're professionals. They're good players. They're smart players, especially. So should go well. Madison's just... He's not made me miss Harry Kane whatsoever. We often said it takes two players to replace Harry Kane. Last season, Son was just didn't exist. Kulisevsky just didn't exist, right? We didn't even have a creative midfielder. It takes two players to replace Harry Kane, and we've done that. We've replaced Harry Kane's goals with Son's clinicality, because he's back, baby, he's back. And we've replaced Kane's sheer creativity and tenacity with Madison. Unbelievable. To come in to Tottenham with the level of maturity to slap the vice captain armband on him so early shows us so much of his character. Madison, you're looking special. You're having a you you're you're just looking you're looking like the main man that Tottenham have needed for years that have been crying out for since Ericsson left four years ago. You are the man to take us to the top, and we believe in you 100%. Kulusevski, he's back. He's actually playing really good again. He's the clunkiest inverted winger and regular winger I've ever seen in my life. But he gets the job done. He's strangely skillful. Strangely ballerina-like when he wants to be. Very strange winger. Very effective winger. Very good winger. And he's 23. All these players are so young. With the exception of Son, who's 30. 31, 30. Um, all our starting lineup is the perfect age for growing into peak football, for peak poster Coglu ball. They're all at the perfect age, essentially. And Son's still got another two, three good years in him. Because Son, I believe, can play even without his pace. I still believe he's a, a just a lethal finisher. Speaking of lethal finishers, I still have no idea who takes penalties for us this season. You see all the stats as well that are saying that Tottenham are 7th for next G. And that's the biggest disparity in the league currently. Obviously, besides Everton, who are like 5th in XG and 17th in the table, or Chelsea, who are like 12th in the table and 4th in XG. Tottenham are like 8th in XG and obviously 1st in the table. But that is such an unfair comparison when we are the only club in the Premier this season, and I believe we are, don't know exactly, but we are the only club that I know off the top of my head that um, we've not had a penalty this season. And of course, a penalty makes up like... 0.80 xg so it makes up a significant chunk of an xg and we're the only club to have not had any penalties in our favor this season which is why i still don't even know who our penalty takers are this season i think it will be son then madison then richarlison but it probably could be richarlison to get his confidence up more so we'll see and then richarlison these two assists a goal two goals two assists two goals yeah two goals two assists not bad not great at all. If he had buried against Luton, people would be talking about him differently right now. People would be saying, three goals, two assists in six games. It's a good start. He's going to come good for Postecoglou. But because he missed that easy chance against Luton, people are doubting him again. And I, I, I still back him. I'll still back him. Whether he plays on the left wing or up front, I'll still back him. This is a man who's who's dragged Everton, you know, kicking and screaming out the relegation zone and saved them. This is a man who um, scored free for Brazil at the World Cup, including the pus that Puskas Worthy winning goal. Uh, of course, that bicycle kick from that. Um, I don't remember who it was by, but that was obviously better. But um, yeah, Richarlison Worthy, like second or third place for sure. What a goal that was. I still back him. Solomon, he's been decent, you know, free transfer. Little Maisie, Aaron Lennon type, with probably a bit more end product. You know, can't complain because we could probably flip him for like 15 million next year, 20 million, 10 million. So, tidy little profit from the club. And then, you know, bring in another foreign spot winger to use in our squad list. So, happy with Solomon, no complaints. Hill, Lo Celso, uh, Brennan, all need. Game time, all need more play time. Brennan looked good when he came on. Uh, when he played against Arsenal, he looked good. He just needs game time. Uh, and yeah, I think that's the uh, vast majority of the squad right now. And uh, we've got Fulham next at home 
and traditionally we should beat them we should beat them at home and then we've got Palace that is probably going to be our biggest test of the season Friday night kickoff under the lights of Selhurst Park atmosphere booming Crystal Palace have one of the best fan bases in the league Hodgson's cooking is Eze and Elise fit? I don't know if they are I'll be scared and uh, that's probably our biggest test coming soon. I don't consider Chelsea a test. Although I do believe they'll beat Arsenal. Com not comfortably. I believe that... I don't want to say comfortably. But I feel like it'll be like a 3-1 or a 2-0 or a 3-0. But I don't think it'll be comfortable. I actually do think they'll beat Arsenal. So, we'll see there. But yeah, it's everything's looking good so far. We will revisit the title talk if we're in Christmas, if there's a sizable gap or we're in the race or it's looking promising. But just, yeah, no Spurs fans talking about the title. Just no, I just want that narrative to be absolutely clear. We do not care at all. We're just happy to watch good football. Thank you, Postacoglu, for some good attacking football, finally.